And the more I did on the ground, the more I started to understand, the more I started to figure her out and her unique little patterns of things that she does, the less I worried about the riding element, if I don't. And I actually felt from that much a huge weight had been lifted. I would challenge anybody, anybody out there that is currently riding their horse, to just rest for a month. Rest for two months, work on all of those things. And it, for me, it's working and getting really good at the basic stuff. Chapter, we've got to get out of this mindset that because we can't ride our horses, it's the end. It's not, it's just the beginning of something else that's amazing. Yes. And don't waste your time worrying about what other people are doing or worrying about any pressures of riding. Enjoy those moments that you have with your horse because they're precious. Hello and welcome to the Curious Equestrian podcast with me, Anna Louise. Today, in today's episode, we are delving deep into the world of unridden equines and the special journey of one Exmoor pony named Cloudy. Our guest today is Claire Artis, and she's here to share that inspiring journey, her experiences, the challenges, and the remarkable bond that she's developed with Cloudy. Her journey takes us on a path less travelled in the equestrian world, where the value of non-ridden horses often gets unrecognised. So Claire, welcome to the podcast and thank you so much for sharing your journey with Cloudy in an article that you wrote for the Horsemanship Journal. But for those who don't know, tell us a bit more about Cloudy and the backstory. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So to give a little bit of a, a in-depth ish background story i've had cloudy now um for coming up for three years i've had her for i've been around horses for over 30 years i've worked with them professionally before i had my children and cloudy came along uh all the traditional senses that i thought i knew so much about she kind of changed the whole plan on that and when she arrived she arrived as a pony that was broken to ride under saddle totally different story when she actually was physically there the first time I brought the saddle out to her she actually bolted and everything in a traditional sense that I was trying to do with her nothing was working so that got me thinking a little bit more let's go down a slightly different route here and let's try something more on the psychology based so I started researching, looking into as much as I could about horse psychology, their body language, the way they, their minds work and stuff like that. And it opened up so many doors from that point. Originally, when she arrived, I couldn't catch her. I couldn't get anywhere near her ears. She was terrified of anyone going near her head. So anytime I tried to hold to her, her head would ping up and she'd just be gone. So over a really long period of time, reading her body language and starting to understand a little bit more in depth the way she worked I was able to slowly get to the point where I could catch her confidently I could touch her ears and very very slowly started to reintroduce the saddle and a lot of foundations that I'd never even heard of I'd never even used that went far beyond the realms of long reining or lunging anything like that just the real real basic stuff that every horse out there should know and while I was going through this whole process which lasted about a year I had the real start realization I didn't know as much about horses as I thought I did and as this journey sort of unfolded I spent a year I put everything to one side I thought I've got to go right back to the beginning here don't even worry about riding saddles nothing like that build on that relationship make sure I can work on that I can get her Whenever I want to approach her in the field, I know I'll be able to catch her or she'll catch me and just work on those those things and those all those groundwork basics and really start to understand how she ticks, what's going to help her, what's going to benefit her throughout this whole journey and what I'm trying to do. So saddle was put away for about a year. And the more I did on the ground, the more I started to understand, the more I started to figure her out and her unique little patterns of things that she does, the less I worried about the riding element. And I actually thought, you know, this is really good fun. This is brilliant. I'm gaining so much from it. I'm getting a fantastic relationship and bond with this pony. But we got to a point where I thought, you know what? After working a really long time with the saddle, because it was a fear that I wanted to get her over 
for her benefit as much as mine. One of my passions in life, I love to take the horse that's not confident and build on that confidence to make them amazing and powerful and just to see that unfold before your eyes. But it was a long process. Probably took me eight months at least to get her to the point where she was confident and happy with the saddle and I was able to saddle at liberty. One day I decided I felt the time was right. It wasn't prepared or anything that I climbed board, just in a small area, just to get on, get off. And we'd just work on that, just the getting on and getting off part on the mounting block, make sure she was confident, happy to stand and things like that, which she was, it was great. And slowly we started to eke out a little bit to slightly bigger areas and we were just walking around and things were going swimmingly well, probably for about almost a year things were great and then one day we had a little setback and we parted company and that particular day I popped her back into the stable I thought right that's fine okay it's a little blip it'll be fine the next day I brought her out into the paddock to go and ride and she completely shut down if anyone doesn't understand of very briefly she's a very introverted horse so she'll hold all her emotions inside and when she shuts down, it's something I've I've seen at the beginning of our journey, something she'd do an awful lot of. And it's heartbreaking to see. So she would just drop her head to the floor. She wouldn't blink. Her breathing would change. And you can just see her. In, so she's just trying to internally process what is going to happen or try and understand in her own way how she's going to respond to what's going on. And it was at that point there, I kind of, I popped her back into the into the field and I left it for the day and I, I went home. I cried for a while. <laughs> but in my heart of hearts, the only reason I got cloudy was so that I could go hacking. I just wanted to have a hacking pony. I've done all my competing. That was all done in my early life. I thought, right, just to have a hacking pony. And it was at that point then I thought to myself, I can either go back and redo everything that I've done and get her back to the point where we were. Or... In her best interests, I can say, do you know what? The riding part, it's not important. It doesn't matter. It was such a big trauma and it was obviously such a big trigger for her, our parting of companies. And I thought, I'll just leave it. I won't ride anymore. It's in her best interests if I don't. And I actually felt from that much a huge weight had been lifted. And I went out into the paddock the next day and we just had fun. And from then on, I just, I absolutely love it. Absolutely love it. The, the things that I've done with her and the things that we've learned together, I've never done anything like that. And I know that I would never have done anything like that had I have ridden. And I'm a very big believer. I think our horses, they're really smart. They're really clever. And I think they only show us when we're on their backs, a small little glimmer of that. When you're right there next to them, beside them, that's when you really see what's going on in that mind and how smart they are. And it, it blows me away. It really does. And when you say that a weight lifted off your shoulder in that moment, do you think it's because there is a pressure yeah. in the equestrian industry yep. to ride your horse? Yep, 100%. 100%. And that's a question I often query, actually. Um, because obviously a massive part of the equine world is made up from people that ride. Now, do those people ride because they, and we do, we all love riding. I've ridden for 30 years and I loved it. But do we ride because that's what society dictates we should be doing? Or are we riding generally because that's what we want to do? And I think there is, there's a massive pressure on those and it can come from any walk of life I mean for example my mum's 70 she'll be 70 in February bless her heart she hasn't ridden for a number of years because she lost her confidence I've got a golden oldie and my old boy sadly passed when he was 34 so obviously there comes a point in their life where they can't be ridden anymore we've got Suki she's 35 can't be ridden I've got a youngster who's too young well he's four but in my opinion he's too mm. young mm -hmm. and we still don't know how his journey is going to go I don't I don't care if he's not riding pony that's fine that's that will be for him to choose and him to decide there is so much pressure 
on us, I think. And I remember last summer, uh, last winter seeing loads of comments of posts of people putting on social media how bad they felt because they couldn't ride their horse. There's so many other things that you can do. And there's so many things that you can do in small spaces that don't involve the riding part. But for me, my relationship with her has grown in ways that I never thought possible because I'm on the ground right there next to her. And Claire, I so connected to your story when I was reading about you and Cloudy because, and I don't know how many people have been affected by this, but I bought a mare in 2019 and she was supposed to be backed ready to go no vices and over she came from Ireland and I was absolutely thrilled when she came very carefully and and patiently off the back of a juggernaut lorry and she traveled really well she was lovely in the field she was great on the ground she wasn't at all vicious we then my great friend Tali who's been riding and training horses since before she could walk she said, oh, Anna, I'll get on her for you and just see how she goes. We'll just see what she's like. You know, she's had a long journey. So we'd given her a few weeks. On Tali gets, Tali breaks in stallions. She trains, you know, horses that have had difficult pasts. She was on for all of five minutes and she was thrown through the air. Wow. And Tali hadn't fallen off for 20 years. And Tali said, Anna, this horse hasn't been backed. And the look of horror on my face we started from scratch, but it appeared, just as with Cloudy, there was a lot of trauma there. She didn't like a head touch. She didn't know what a treat was. I'd hold out my hand. She'd sniff it and didn't know what it was because no one had ever given her a treat. She was scared. She was scared of whips. She was scared of tall, stable tools. So we had to start, like you and Cloudy, right from the beginning. Yeah. Um, to which we did get to the stage where we could ride Winnie. But now she started bronking. So we have a whole nother journey that has come up through the backing process that now she's bronching despite having had her back checked, teeth teeth checked and vets checked. So we're now wondering whether that is her saying she doesn't want to be ridden, that it's linked to previous trauma. And we're now, like you say, sort of on a journey to investigate what Winnie's happy doing, whether she wants to be ridden, whether this is a trauma she can overcome or whether actually Winnie would just prefer to be a very large field ornament and another pet that's a member of the family which we're also really happy to do because being on the ground like you say at liberty in the field or lunging has been hugely rewarding and something that I have so looked forward to to do that groundwork and we have a bond like no other you know she'll follow me totally unattached wherever I go whether I'm walking or jogging she will run alongside me and canter alongside me and I throughout my entire life of riding I've never had a bond no. like it no <laughs> and yet people passing by will look over the fence and say when are you going to ride that horse yeah. have you ridden that horse yet and it's that constant layer isn't it, it that is. sort of lands on your shoulder that you're doing something you're not doing something with your horse that you're supposed to be doing yeah yeah, there is, sadly, there is, yeah. And I speak to quite a few people that are on livery yards and they've got that outside pressure as well of when are you going to ride? And it is, It's for me, when I drew that line and I decided that was it, I'm not going to ride and that element had completely gone. For me personally, it was, I think so many see that individually as a failure or it's the end of a journey, it's the end of the story and that's it. And it's not, it's just a new chapter. It's just a new way to be with horses. And it is something that needs to be spoken about. It needs to be put out there more because like I say, at some point or another, sadly, it is going to affect us at some point. And I'm all for the field ornament, truly I am. Happy horse out there enjoying life, but there can be and there is so much more. One of my most incredible moments that I've had with horses, I was out walking with Cloudy one afternoon and my mum was with me. She often comes around, sort of just keeps me company with Cloudy. And we were walking along the bottom of the farmer's fields and the grass was knee deep. I'm away from any roads um, in the middle of nowhere and the stables are probably about a five minute, 10 minute walk away. And I just had this gut feeling. I just thought, I'm just going to unclip the rope. Let's just see what happens here. So I unclipped the rope and she stayed and ate the grass for a moment or two. And I just carried on walking. And I just turned over my right shoulder. I just went, you come in then. 
and she just came back with me and she did not leave my side and we were knee deep in grass we had these masses of big wide open spaces around us and she just she was there right there with me and I know that if I hadn't have built up everything that I'd built up on the ground there was no way that any of I mean if I'd have a horse that I'd have had for 30 years if I'd have unclipped him he'd have been gone but building that up from the ground and doing everything and working on that relationship without even worrying about setting foot on their back, putting a foot in a stirrup, nothing like that. It just, the possibilities are endless. And every day, every moment, I get these, wow, did that actually just happen? And it's not happened because I'm riding, it's happened because I'm right there. And if you think of the very small element that riding actually makes up anyway, there's so much more to the horse than just riding. And Claire, what do you think, judging by how your understanding of Claudia's developed, what do you think happened to her in her previous life? I think she was probably backed too early. And I also think it was rushed and thresholds ignored. Again, probably comes down to the fact that people don't, a lot of people, I mean, I came from a very traditional world. And we're not taught to listen to the horse. We're taught that the horse is there to do what we want it to do. And I personally, where I'm at now, I don't agree with leadership. I don't believe that I want to be the boss. I believe I want a relationship on equal terms. And that works two ways. And I'll give you a lot. In the early days, when I first had Cloudy, we have to walk across a grass area to get to the training paddock. And she'd get halfway and she'd just plant her feet and stop. Now, in a traditional sense, we probably would have pulled, pushed, done everything we possibly could think of to get that horse to go forward. What did I do? I let her eat grass. So there she stood eating the grass. I'd eat the, we'd eat the grass for a few moments. Then we'd walk forward another few steps. We'd eat a bit more grass. And then we'd walk forward a few more steps. We'd eat a bit more grass. And then lo and behold, we're at the training paddock gate. <laughs> We worked together. So I saw her needs. We'll eat grass, okay? We'll eat the grass. And then we'll move forward a little bit. And that to me is working in two ways. And whatever I do with my horses now, wherever I am, whatever I want to do, whatever I'd like to achieve, what's in it for my horse? What can I do in whatever it is that I'm trying? What can I do to make this better for them? How can I make this experience something that they're going to want to remember in a good way and want to do again and they're going to be waiting there at the field gate for me tomorrow because I've thought how can I make this better for them what other sort of trust techniques have you used Claire I mean you sound like you've just thought about your horse as you've gone along but what have you put in place to sort of show Cloudy that actually not all humans are the same and that you're worth trusting. I listened. <laughs> I listened. So by going into the more psychology side of horsemanship, it taught me when to step back. So watching all those little changes in her body language, watching where her ears were, watching if there's any tension in her nose, and just slowing everything down. So in my mind, I thought I was going slow, but that wasn't slow enough slow it down even more and there were times where she'd just turn her bum on me and go and plant her head in the corner of the stable and okay that's fine we'll just wait and just by giving her that moment just to step back give her that space she'd turn around and go oh okay then what's going on what are we doing now just slowing everything down and I think for Cloudy especially dignity was a massive and still is a massive thing to her so it's watching out for the little things. Like if I'm going around one side and she's tipping her nose to block me, I'll just wait a minute. It's about not saying and, and telling the horse we're doing this. We ask. Do you, do you mind? And in my head, I'm always thinking, is it OK if I do this? Do you mind? It's all good. OK, we're fine. Then we'll carry on. Um, Claire, I was going to ask you, what techniques did you use? You used time. You used listening. What other techniques did you use to gain her trust with her problem ears that she didn't want you touching and with things like allowing you into her space to deal with things like thorns and laminitis? Yeah, I mean, 
originally with with our ears there was a lot of um they say approach and retreat i used retreat and approach <laughs> so it was a very slow process of just trying to see if i could just touch her ear and then i'd move my hand away but all the time just watching for any little signs of anything little tiny shifts of weight if she'd be trying to shift her weight and lean back then i'd obviously retreat just watching for little tiny things like that. I mean, the thorn, that was a whole nother level because I actually had to use a stick <laughs> and try at a distance away to try and use a stick to just rub her with the stick near where the thorn Ooh. was. And it took me a week rubbing her with this stick before I was able to finally get my hand in there and just gently pull this thorn out. So it it's just constantly just watching for any tiny little... And you become almost... I want to say hyper aware of it. It's not because for me now it's everyday life. And I just assume that everyone else out there in the world is doing what I'm doing and they're not. So it's just a really very gradual, slow, just watching for any tiny little signs. I mean, at the moment she's really suffering because she's been on box rest for quite a while. So she's suffering with getting that movement in her back end. And she's very sore. Her front feet were very sore. And her way of telling me that she's sore, other than obviously I can physically see it, when I'm trying to go to the areas, she's trying to bite me. Now, obviously, in the normal sense, we'd see that as maybe being a bit rude, a bit disrespectful. But for me, I understand that she's telling me she's hurting, it's sore. But at the same time, there's still things that I have to do for everyday care just to make sure she's recovering. So by watching and just slowly retreating and just taking my time and something as well I think we're often taught in the more traditional sense is when our horses get angry it escalates because when they get frustrated we get frustrated when they get angry we get angry and it's building breaking down those walls so that when they get frustrated or when something bothers them it doesn't bother us so we learn then to control our own emotions and as stupid as it sounds, remember to breathe. Claire, and you've been telling us throughout the episode of all these different exciting things that we can do with our unridden horse. Can you list off some of the things for inspiration for those listening who think, actually, I might like to try something different? Yeah, I mean, we all know that the normal realms of things, like we could go out for a walk, we can play in the arena, we can do some liberty things, but how can we advance on things like that? So... When I say we could go out for a walk, for example, Cloudy and I last year, we were walking out across the farmer's fields. We have permission, walking out across the farmer's fields and we were going from field to field, jumping ditches. Well, I say we were jumping ditches, <laughs> waiting. I was clambering down and then asking her across. We were jumping ditches. Wow. And the I think for me, when I'm going for a walk, especially, it's quite easy to kind of switch off almost and we can maybe walk ahead of our horse and the horse just kind of plod along behind completely disengaged to what we're doing and not really connected to us so for me it's making sure that I'm walking right there with her like I would if I went for a walk with a friend I wouldn't leave my friend trailing behind so I'm right there next to her um just soaking up the atmosphere so we might just stop taking our surroundings and what's going on and just having a breather and making sure also that I've got a nice long rope. So if it's safe to do so, she can roam a little bit. She can forage for things that she might not be able to find in the field. So that's a great, that's one of my favourite things to do, actually going out for a walk. But from a, in the arena kind of element, in a training paddock, I like to very much use play. So anything that I can tap into, we've got like a giant gym ball. We might get that out. She can push it with her nose. She can kick it with her legs. Also works really well with the baby. He's four. He loves the giant Ooh. ball. Gets them used to things going around them. You can bounce it. So it gets them used to things either side of them. You can throw it over the top of them and things like that. And from a, I don't like to use the terminology desensitize. I prefer to build confidence. So if you think of something your horse might be most fearful of, you can then take that into the training paddock and use different things to try and help them get over those fears. Like Cloudy wasn't very good with anything that flapped, anything that moved. So my first, well, let's lay down some tarpaulin. So we play walking across the tarpaulin and then can she stand on the tarpaulin? 
can she go backwards on the tarpaulin? Can we put a jump on the tarpaulin so she can jump over it? So I think it's for me, it's taking various different obstacles, anything from cones, tires, pallets that I use as pedestals, just reinforced with a bit of MDF, some carpet over the top so that it's not slippery. Um, poles to do lots of different pole work, barrels, which I've got, my barrels are just recycled water butts. We can go sideways over the barrels. We could open the barrels up and we could squeeze between the barrels. We could put the barrels one on top of the other and we could knock them over. So I think it's, and once you start on that little journey of different obstacles, you think of different things that you can do with each of those obstacles. And it is, it's mind blowing what you can do with one pole. It's being imaginative. Oh, it is. And it just, it gets really taps into your creative juices. I mean, I've got, my paddock is never free of stuff. There's always stuff in it. And whenever I'm going out there, I'm always thinking of something that I want to focus on, something in particular I want to do that day. I've also got a backup plan in case that doesn't work or the horse for whatever it isn't in the mood to do whatever I'm trying to achieve that day, that I've got something else there. But it's having that little goal to work towards. Um, Claire, your decision to transition Cloudy from a ridden horse to an unridden horse is so interesting and I think a journey that many people haven't been on but maybe want to consider. What would you say to those who are thinking possibly about trying to move into the world of unridden horses and try different activities but might still feel that pressure that they need to be riding? Yeah, it is definitely a tough one to try and overcome, I must admit. I mean, what helped massively from my point of view is I knew that it was in the best interests of Cloudy. So putting my own thoughts, needs to one side, but there is, unfortunately, there is still that big pressure around us to ride because I think obviously that's primarily the main focus of why people get a horse. But for me, I think it's just, as I've said, I think before, it's elaborating more on that journey and making that transition i would challenge anybody anybody out there that is currently riding their horse to just rest for a month rest for two months work on all those things and for me it's working and getting really good at the basic stuff there's so many horses out there for example that struggle to even stand still so it's working on those little things and when you start working on those things it does amazing things for your connection with your horse which will help massively when you're in the saddle anyway so for me it's getting really good at those basic things so even if you don't think break it down into smaller pieces if you don't think i'm never going to ride again think of it okay well let's just try it let's try it for a month let's try it for a couple of months see what happens to your relationship with your horse because i'm you will never regret it it will be a decision that you will never regret and Personally, every day now, there is not one single element of riding that I miss. I'm having far too much fun to even worry about that. And we've got a herd of five. None of them are ridden. We are loving life. I go out to my paddock. I do my training bits. We go out for walks. We forage. I feel completely free of pressure. I'm relaxed to enjoy my pony because let's face it, the majority of us are in it for recreational purposes. Today's world, we're all rushed. We've got things that we've got to go out and do. Our moments with our horses are so, so precious. Don't waste your time worrying about what other people are doing or worrying about any pressures of riding. Enjoy those moments that you have with your horse because they're precious. And what do you do when, I know this happens to you, when I have people stick their head over the fence, they're not even horsey. They are just villagers that want to say, when are you riding? When are you going to get on that horse? Why are you not riding that horse? For me, I'm constantly trying to explain that these horses are either on a break or we're trying something different or we're doing groundwork. What do you say to those people, whether it's friends, family, equestrians, or just nosy villagers that stick their heads over and, and try and criticise what you're doing? It is a real, real struggle. And I'll be brutally honest, it's one even to this day that I do struggle with. Um, and we've got, there's a lot in the village where I keep cloudy, there's a lot of horses. And I've not, quite often we'll go venture down our lane and we'll just, we've got a lovely patch of grass. We'll just stand and let the horses eat some grass. And you might get the one or two passers by on their horses riding. And, and you can see them looking and the odd ones kind of stopped and had a chat. And it's just something that's just unheard of in a whole village that, of horses I've never seen anyone hand graze their horses and it is because you almost feel 
embarrassed in a way to say, oh, well, I'm not riding. And you do almost have to justify that fact of why you're not riding. But for me, I've come to the vast realization that it's my journey. This is for me, this is what I'm doing. And I'm loving what I'm doing and I'm enjoying what I'm doing. If you want to ride, that's obviously completely entirely up to you. But for me in this moment and for what my horse needs, this is what I'm doing. And for me, I think once you start doing the things you're doing for the horse, everybody else's opinions and assumption of what you're doing, they don't matter so much. But it is to, it's something that needs to be more accessible. We don't need to, as a question, need to feel bad or that we need to justify the reasons of why we're not riding but it is it is something I do still struggle with sadly and through your journey with Cloudy what have you learned about the value of non-ridden horses in horsemanship oh (laughs) yeah there is so much I think when you stopped riding so when you make that decision to stop riding you start looking at every single other aspect of how you can enhance your horse's life. How can you keep making it better? And that, it for me, at the moment, is all that matters. Nothing else matters but trying to create the best environment that I can for her with what facilities and what I've got available to me. And I think when we're so focused on the riding part, it's very easy to forget those parts. Because we all have limited time, we only have a certain to get on and we must ride this horse Mm. when you take that out of the equation think about all that more free time that you have to put into other areas of sort of looking at the way that you're doing your basic things looking at the way your horse is living that might otherwise be taken up and focused with things like going riding It's interesting, isn't it? Because often we all start all of our journeys with horses initially, whether it's as children, teenagers or adults, usually begins in the arena, doesn't it? At a riding school or riding a friend's horse. So it always begins with riding. Do you think we almost need to go back or riding schools maybe need to look at kind of what they can offer and include groundwork in those lessons so that we appreciate that just as much as the ridden element? massively yeah a hundred percent a hundred percent and if even if not thinking from the horse's perspective from our perspective as well what we're teaching in riding schools at the moment because they are so riding focused we're not teaching people how to be safe so we've lost a massive safety element of what we're doing because we don't know how to read the horse we don't know how to look out for signals of anxiety stress we're not taught that because we're taught just to get on and ride we're missing a massive valuable link because we're not focusing on the groundwork and getting those skills. And also I think because there's so much focus on the riding part, our young horses are missing out on those that valuable time because there is so much more to groundwork than lunging and long reining. Mm. I very rarely do. It's so much bigger than that and it's getting into the horse's mind and We're so focused on getting our horses moving that we forget the mind element. And you can't work on the mind element if you're not working on the ground. That's so interesting. And also, I love, Claire, that you go walking in hand with your mum, who's 70. I go walking in hand with my Winnie, my mare, and my mum, and we go foraging the hedgerows, and we walk around the country lanes. And it's so interesting, isn't it, watching people's reaction as you come around the corner. Probably people expect you to be walking a dog. And then they're startled to see a horse coming towards them, aren't they? And often we're stopped for people to say, you know, people stop us and say, oh, why are you walking that horse? You know, is it injured? No, we're we're walking because we love it and it's time off for Winnie and she doesn't have to be thinking she's in work mode and carrying us on on her back. So it's trying to change people's perspectives, even those that are out walking their dogs or walking around the corners who are sort of confused by what they see. It's so important to bring topics like this to light because it is definitely and I hear about it so many times I've got a friend of mine who sadly can't ride because she's injured um, and that's a long and progressive thing for her but she can't ride she hung up her riding hat and she felt awful and I was like don't think of it as a bad thing just think it's another step to your journey it's another you're expanding on things that you've already done and you're just going to keep on making them better it's a new chapter we've got to get out of this mindset that because we can't ride our horses it's the end it's not 
it's just the beginning of something else that's amazing and the things I've achieved with Cloudy I've never achieved with any horse before because I've always focused on the riding part now I've got all the time in the world to go sideways over barrels can she go on the pedestal can we go on the pedestal with one foot can we go on the pedestal with two feet can we turn around on the pedestal but there's so many more elements to things that that we can do and we can achieve and that anyone can transition because it sounds like yourself, you know, you competed from a young age. I was that child who was counting down the days to the next riding lesson and completely riding obsessed and have ridden all my life. And yet still I am enjoying the groundwork and the liberty and the walking just as much as life in the saddle. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think for me, it was almost a pressure to ride. So for me, once that was gone, and I had all that extra time. It was, yeah, amazing, amazing thing. And before you go, Claire, you've described your relationship with Cloudy as magical. Can you take us to a magical moment for you that summarises that or that harnesses that feeling that when you're together? It's, to be honest, it's the everyday things that people don't see. It's the everyday stuff. Um, and it still blows my mind. I mean, I've mentioned, touched on, she's quite poorly at the moment. She's sadly been on box rest for a little while. And it's something as silly as I can take you to yesterday. I was in the stable. She was just outside her stable with her bottom to me. And I needed her back into her stable. I can stand at her back wall and just go back. And she'll back up to come to me. So it's little things like that. I can use the most simplest of gestures. And this is every day. If I need her to just relocate slightly, I can just stand next to her and just tip my head slightly and just say, could you just go that way a little bit? just with the most tiniest little movement and gesture and she'll she'll carry it and she'll do it for me so every day is a magical day I'm not going to lie and I'm just I get blown away by the things that unfold every day even when when you're locked down as it has been now and I can honestly say she has just been incredible throughout and it's interesting isn't it because we love our dogs and we spend every minute with our dogs that live in houses. But there's something about working with a horse, asking your horse to do something that has a whole nother feeling because they are such huge beasts, aren't they? They don't have to listen to us. They, they could do whatever they wanted, but they choose, like you say, to listen to your voice or your, the tiniest of gestures. Yeah. And that connection is, is, is like no other. It really is. It really is. And even just I've got a friend of mine who has a pony that once upon a time she couldn't lead it anywhere without a bridle and a hard hat on because she feared for her life she spent a very very long time doing ground work she's now riding that pony out in company in a bitless bridle loving life because she spent a long time on the ground building on all the things that I've I've guided her to do she's built on all of those and her connection now is that brilliant that she can go out on a horse that was once dangerous, bitless, with company, loving life? What do you think that you can do that we can all do to, to communicate the journey of an unridden horse and make it exciting enough to appeal to the wider equestrian industry? Well, I mean, you've definitely got to work on that connection for sure. And it's the little things that we implement every day. Um, just, you've got to try it. <laughs> you've got to try it. Take Claire's instructions. Out there, <laughs> just, you've got to try it. You've got to try it. As I say, I would challenge anyone to take a month, two months off from riding their horse. Take away the pressure. Winter's coming. Take away that pressure. Work on other things. Go in the paddock and just let your creativity flow. Because I think our horses are very much like when you you're schooling young children mm. when they first start their foundation years at primary school for example they learn through play play with your horse don't train go play mm. and then that takes the pressure off of us if we see yeah. it as playing not training where we exactly. have to achieve certain things yeah I'm not a big fan of the word training but it's one of the ones that's that's mainstream isn't it but also when we play our horses feel that energy they feel that positivity and they're learning things as we're teaching them they're learning it through their play and they don't even realizing and that's again that takes the pressure away as you say it takes the pressure away and it's it helps to build on that connection and you end up with amazing things at the end of it 
For those listening, Claire, who want to follow your journey with Cloudy or who are seeking inspiration for their own horses, how do they find you and get in touch with you? Yeah, I'm on Instagram at Claire Artist Horsemanship and also Facebook at Claire Artist Horsemanship. Claire, thank you so much. I think you've inspired us all to go and put the training to one side and go and play with our horses in the field, in the paddocks, in the arena. Thank you so much for coming on. You've been fascinating. And I've certainly connected your journey with my journey with my mare, Winnie. And I wish we could go walking together with our horses. We need to. Let's set it up. Let's do it. Claire, thank you for coming on the podcast. And don't forget, if you're listening, to subscribe to Curious Equestrian wherever you're listening or watching and follow us on social media. And we'll see you next time for the next inspiring guest.